There are only certain things that trouble me, and after the disappearance of our only daughter Sam, the love of our life, nothing could trouble me. Sam had been looking on Craigslist to find a roommate, and soon discovered a beautiful old house, with the owner seeking a female or gay roommate. It was about six years ago, and the day she left to check out the place she never came back. Soon after, my wife, June, went into a deep depression, rarely appearing from our bedroom. She wouldn't talk, either. Rather, she would mumble and grunt or sing small snatches of tunes I'd never heard before. Doctors were of no help. They told me what I already knew. My wife was depressed because of our missing daughter. And so, one night, I found myself looking deep into my wife's hazel eyes and asking her, what would make you happy? There was a heavy silence between us while she looked deep into my eyes and finally said, to watch a child, my child, grow up. And so, we were overjoyed when we found my wife was pregnant again with another daughter. We named her Joy and kept watch over her like a hawk. As she grew, we found that she was witty and sharp, and our hearts were again filled with love. And then, when Joy had just turned 16, at 5 in the morning, there was frantic knocking at our front door. Quick, sharp knocks that echoed through our quiet, sleeping household. I shot out of bed and ran downstairs, cursing whatever solicitor decided to bother us at this hour. Planning to give them an earful, I swung the door open and yelled, What? And then, oh, oh my god. It was Sam. Although she was older, I recognized her immediately. She was dirty, her hair in knots, filth under her fingernails and bags under her eyes. June had come downstairs to see what the commotion was and began to cry almost immediately. After taking a shower, Sam slept for several days. Joy was anxious to meet her big sister and our hearts overflowed with the love and happiness. Nothing, absolutely nothing could ruin this. About two days ago, I got home from the gym. June had taken the girls shopping, so I was left to my own devices. Around three in the afternoon, our phone rang. Caller ID said it was the local police. Immediately worried, I picked it up. Mr. My last name? A gruff voice asked. Yes, I replied, wondering what this could be about. We, uh, we, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but we found your daughter, Sam. She was discovered in a crawl space of an old house. Based on the tests, she's been dead for six years. I live in a boring California suburb. All of the houses line up in neat rows of matching beige. Being a 16-year-old kid, I needed a summer job and decided the best idea would be to seek one on Craigslist. I found an ad for a lifeguard job in a neighborhood around five minutes away from mine. I've driven by there before. The grass is neat and trim, and the neighborhood is always humming with the whir of hundreds of air conditioning units. Skipping the details, I had lifeguarded before and quickly got the job. Despite the drought, the community pool was open every day from 9 to 9, but nobody ever swims after dark. As I was leaving the pool one night, I ran into another employee who was sent to lock up. It's not safe to be here by yourself at night, he said as I passed. I laughed. I'm a pretty strong swimmer. I'm not too worried. He shook his head and stared through the black iron gate. A few years ago, there was a girl who would hang out here every day. From the first day of summer until the pool closed for autumn, this girl would be by here every day. And when she was done swimming, she'd sit on lawn chairs until her hair was dry and the sun was setting. It always seemed like her favorite days were the days where nobody else was here. She came swimming at night, but something happened and she never made it home. They never found a body either, though. The kids tell a story that one night she heard a noise at her window, and when she got out of bed the screen was torn and there was a painted wooden fish on this windowsill. Carved in the side of the fish were the words, Catch me where I was caught. The girl picked up the fish and put it under her pillow. The next day she was packing her towel and shorts. She remembered the fish and decided to take it with her. When she got to the pool, there were several other families there, so she left the fish in her bag and swam laps in the deep end. That night, however, after the pool was closed, she slid open her window and crawled out, fish in hand. She used her flip-flop to jimmy the lock open and tiptoed to the deep end. She crouched over the edge of the pool and dropped the little wooden fish into the water. Legend has it that she fell in and never came out. I stared at the boy, trying to figure out if he really expected me to believe that. He laughed after a while and picked up my bag, handing it to me. I mean, it's just a legend, but they don't really know what happened to that girl. And he turned and began walking up the sidewalk. I went up the path in the opposite direction, got in my car, and drove home. I wanted to write it down before I forgot. It's stupid, but it was an interesting story, and I had been looking for something to use for the term paper in my modern mythology class. What scared me the most was what happened later that night. I'm not sure if it was the same boy pranking me, or just a noise, but I heard my window open, only to find a wooden fish on my windowsill. I've always been the type who is never able to hold down a job for longer than a few months at a time. Call it bad luck, but any place that I ever worked at either went out of business a few months after I was hired, or they had to lay people off for an unknown external reason. Somehow, I always ended up getting into the group that got sent packing. 
Maybe it's my own fault for seeking employment in the most obscure, unvisited locations that my city has to offer, but I digress. Actually, that fact is pretty important. It's what's about to lead into the horror show of a story I'm about to tell that took place a few months ago. It was a day like any other, and I was desperately searching for a job. My landlord was on my ass for an overdue rent, and I had a phone bill that scared the hell out of me to look at. All that was in my fridge was a block of cheese that was about three days from expiring. So, I went looking on Craigslist. I searched around the site and found an ad for a restaurant in my town called The Grounds with the title, Now Hiring Kitchen Help. It listed the address of the small place, and being desperate, it seemed like a decent idea to apply. I had worked a few kitchen jobs at this point, so I drove over to the place and walked inside in the hopes of speaking to the owner. The words on the neon sign right underneath the roof read, The Grounds. What was with all these hipster restaurant names these days? The place was small, but by no means dirty or sketchy looking, so that was already a good start. It wasn't very packed either, some couples out on a date, a group of friends chatting quietly in a corner. Typical small city restaurant scene. I walked up to a young man who was standing behind the counter where people can order food for takeout and I asked if I could speak with the manager. He told me to wait a moment and disappeared behind the door to the kitchen. I waited and after a couple minutes a shorter middle aged man emerged from the side door that I hadn't noticed before with a big sign on that read in huge letters, manager only, do not enter. I found that kind of strange at the time, but given the current situation, I should have known that had trouble written all over it. I'll spare you the details in the mini-interview and skip right ahead to tell you that the man's name was Mr. Montgomery and he hired me on the spot. I was to start in three days as the new cook. Three days later, I found myself back at the grounds and making my way into the kitchen. I was given my instructions by the guy who I had spoken to initially at the takeout counter. His name was David and he also worked in the kitchen occasionally, but mostly he was in charge of takeout orders. Like I said, I had worked the kitchen jobs before, so none of the information was really new to me, and the menu of the grounds was pretty standard stuff that I was sure I would have down packed within a couple of weeks. I was given one very strict rule, however. Do not, under any circumstances, go into Mr. Montgomery's office. Any paperwork that anyone might need to give to him had to be slept under a mail slot next to his door, and if you needed to speak with him or have him come out of his office for any reason, there was an intercom to speak with him in the kitchen. No exceptions. No job I had ever worked at had such intense rules regarding the employee's relationship with the manager, but I needed this job, so despite how weird I found it all, I complied. I made friends there quickly anyways, so the last thing I was thinking about at work was how we were never allowed into Mr. Montgomery's office. A few weeks passed. Nothing seemingly out of the ordinary happened. I went into work, which was generally super quiet, so most of my shift was spent talking to David or anyone else who worked in the kitchen. Clean up the workspace, then go home. Easy. It was around the end of the first month that the first strange incident happened. It was a Friday afternoon, and one of the full-time cooks, Spencer, didn't show up on time. We all assumed he would just be late, so we didn't think anything of it until after two hours, he was still nowhere to be seen. One of us phoned Mr. Montgomery in his office to tell him. He came bustling out of his office with an air of concern, asking if anyone knew how to get into contact with Spencer, but something seemed off about his demeanor. At the time, I just brushed it off as stress, because for some reason, this Friday was the busiest day I had seen since my first day there. It seemed like Mr. Montgomery was faking his concern, like it was a performance, but like I said, it was strangely really busy that day, so I figured it was just stressed out. Everyone got back to work, running around like chickens without heads trying to dish out all these orders, and with one less person to help. At the end of the day, we all tried calling Spencer's cell phone and house phone about 15 times. No answer on either. We called the cops and they said they would go investigate, but there was nothing else we could do. Later, we would learn that when the cops got to Spencer's house, everything was gone. Spencer, his family, and all the furniture, even down to the wallpaper, gone, empty, no note or anything. We were all really spooked when we found out, but we carried on with our jobs because what else was there to do? Fast forward to next month. After that strangely busy day we had a month ago, it all went back to quiet. This was just beyond strange, with Spencer's disappearance on top of it all. The tediousness of the days led to gossip among the group of us who were still working there every day. We would talk in hushed whispers, voicing our suspicions on what we thought was going on. Sometimes Mr. Montgomery would emerge quickly and quietly from his office, like a snake, sneaking up behind us and telling us to go back to work. We would disperse nervously, exchanging glances from across the kitchen as he would amble back into his office without another word, closing the door behind him. At the end of the month, it happened again. Crazy busy day that came literally out of nowhere. But this time it was David who didn't show up. Freaking out since we were short-staffed, we ran the drill from last time, calling him on his cell phone, his home phone, nothing. 
Mr. Montgomery emerged from that office with the air of fake worry, and I almost completely lost my shit. This is the second time this happened. We need to shut down the restaurant and go look for David before he disappears completely like Spencer did. Mr. Montgomery stopped in his tracks, and a fire started up in his eyes unlike any other I had ever seen. I'm sure David is just sick. He will be in tomorrow. This day is great for business, and we're not closing down for anything, he said, with this all matter of factly and a, with a glint of no one disagrees with me or you will regret it in his eyes. We all scrambled back to work, but I was fuming. After work and after I was sure Mr. Montgomery had left, I called the police myself. I told them to come down to the restaurant and launch some sort of investigation because I was sure as anything that my boss had something to do with this. His fake concern, not to mention his office that was suspicious enough no one was ever allowed to enter, this was going to stop once and for all. The next few days were a complete blur. I wasn't present to learn about all the details, but I spoke to the police a couple days after the David disappearance incident. I had gone home from after calling the police, but the next day I came to work and found the place blocked from being entered with do not cross tape circulating the entire premises and a whole squad of police cars with their sirens that I could see and hear from a block away. I would come to learn that after breaking into his heavily locked and guarded office, the police scoured around and found a trapdoor that was hidden by one of his pieces of furniture. They would go down to where the trapdoor led and find a small wooden room that was covered from floor to ceiling with, with strange symbols that they could not recognize, but by putting common sense together, they figured these were either cult or obscure religious symbols. There was a wooden plank in the center of the room that was surrounded by candles, and there were shelves that were lined with jars of dark blood. A forensic investigation later would confirm these jars to be filled with goat's blood. This was a grounds for ritual sacrifice, though no one can confirm yet from what cult or religion any of these objects come from. The bodies of Spencer, David, and their families were never recovered. After the police investigated David's house when we were called about his disappearance, they found it to be in the same condition as Spencer's had been, stripped of everything down to the wallpaper and not a soul in sight. He had a wife and two daughters. I knew that one day a month was ridiculously busy and the disappearance of two men at the exact same time could be no coincidence. It's been months since it happened and since the investigation and questioning was taking so long following Mr. Montgomery's arrest, I was shocked to have recently learned from the police that he was part of a religious cult that would once a month sacrifice a human being and their family in order to generate personal profit and gain. It made me sick to think about that all of his employees were merely pawns in his selfish quest to make money. Who knew who would have been next? Was he planning to whip us all out before hiring a whole new staff who would have been just as clueless as us after the first disappearance? How long did he think he could have gone on without noticing we were all being locked off one by one with no replacements? I don't think Mr. Montgomery had really planned through the sick plan as thoroughly as he should have. He was just a demented fuck who wanted to suckle as much money into his greedy hands in any way necessary. In retrospect, the name of the restaurant practically spelled his plan out in front of all our eyes. After months of living with my ex-boyfriend, I was kinda desperate to find a new place. I decided that searching Craigslist would be a decent idea for possibly finding a roommate, and soon after I moved in with this older woman via an ad for a nice and quiet female roommate, which seemed very unsuspecting to me. After taking my inaugural shower at this new place, she came to me in a panic and took me by the arm, marching me back to the bathroom, furious that I had left the shower wet. The shower? Wet? She insisted I take my towel and dry off the tub and walls after each use. Because I'm a normal person and find that weird and gross, I told her I'd buy a separate towel for post-shower wipe-downs. Unfortunately, this was the only beginning of a panic-stricken list of things I either had to do or could not ever do, including using the plates and silverware while she went out of town. Yes, she kept them locked in her room. Eventually, I had enough, and because I didn't want to live with my ex-boyfriend or parents again, I chose to stay and equally use my belongings and space the way I wanted. This was my biggest mistake. I should have left. After she had gone out of town, I no longer wiped the showers down or cleaned my floors every time I walked on them. I will never forget her face the day she came home from that trip. One of anger, but also disappointment and surprise. She looked at me and scowled as she ran into the basement. I heard her rummaging through boxes and began to feel scared, so I ran into my room and locked the door. The woman ran upstairs, banged on my door screaming, Rat, open up, open up and I won't hurt you. I pushed my dresser and bed up against the door, terrified, and called the police. The woman banged for what seemed like an hour, although it was definitely shorter, when the cops showed up. Eventually I came out when all was safe, and the police let me know that it was a good thing I didn't come out, as the woman had a loaded rifle, and so began another round of apartment searching.